Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. Speaking of the CanMed conference, have you gotten your tickets yet for CanMed 2022? If yes, then I can't wait to see you out in Pasadena this May for another fantastic event. And if not, what are you waiting for? Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to get your tickets. At CanMed 2022, you will learn from the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. And if you want proof of that, look no further than our keynote presenters. Representing our science focus area, we have Dr. Ethan Rousseau presenting about cannabis and psychiatry. Representing our cultivation focus area, we have Dr. Seth Crawford talking about innovations in hemp breeding. Grace Bandong, our safety keynote presenter, will talk about building a comprehensive analytical testing program. And finally, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein will discuss cannabis medicine for children as our medical keynote. Those presentations alone are worth the price of admission, but please go to canmedevents.com to see the full schedule. And if you want a preview of what you can expect at CanMed 2022, check out our CanMed archive, which is a searchable video library of all the past CanMed presentations and panels. Find that at canmedevents.com. At this year's event, we are also offering a full-day pre-conference medical practicum taking place on May 3rd. The medical practicum is led by Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, Dr. Dustin Sulak, Dr. Kevin Spellman, and Eloise Thiessen. Each of them will share the latest medical cannabis research, including information on dosing, drug interactions, and different product types. They will also share their clinical experience they have acquired treating patients with medical cannabis. This really is a must-attend event for any healthcare professionals who are interested in recommending medical cannabis, but it's not limited to those folks. Anyone who is interested in learning more about medical cannabis can and should join us for this event. Head over to canmedevents.com practicum to learn more. Of course, if you can't make it to CanMed 2022, we have a number of resources to help you stay engaged with our community and enjoy some world-class educational content. You are already off to a good start listening to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so new episodes download to your device automatically. Second, we have the CanMed archive that I mentioned earlier. It's a searchable video library of all the past CanMed presentations and panels that you can find at canmedevents.com. While you're at canmedevents.com, be sure to sign up for email alerts. That's the best way to make sure you are up to date on all the latest CanMed news and special offers. Fourth, we have our CanMed community Facebook group, which is a great place to share and discuss news and topics related to cannabis science. The link to that group is in the show description. And finally, you can follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. This episode, we talk with Dr. Punya Nachapa. Punya runs a research program at Colorado State University that is focused on understanding the interactions between plants, pathogens, and insect vectors in crops, including hemp. Her team recently published a paper that identified several different viruses in Colorado hemp samples, most notably beet curly top virus, which is a pathogen known to infect several different plant species. In our conversation, we discuss the prevalence of beet curly top virus in Colorado hemp, how BCTV compares to hop latent viroid, the BCTV disease progression in hemp and cannabis plants, We also talk at length about the only known mode of transmission for BCTV, the beet leaf hopper. We also get into strategies for preventing BCTV and keeping leaf hoppers away. And finally, we discuss other viruses and viroids cannabis and hemp growers should be aware of. Before we get to my conversation with Punya, I'd like to thank this episode's sponsor, Eugentech. Eugentech offers smart analysis and workflow software for endpoint genotyping and qPCR pathogen testing. Stop looking at every cluster or curve, let AI do the work, and lab staff do the review. 
Whether you test for plant and seed health or run studies for breeding or crop science, Fast Finder will allow you to scale up slash eyes on time on cluster calling and genotyping, automate PCR curve calling and result reporting, organize your lab's plates, runs, and studies, and learn from historic data to improve interpretation speed and quality. For more information, go to eugentech.com. That's U-G-E-N-T-E-C dot com. Okay, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Punya Nachapa. Good morning, Punya. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hi, Ben. It's so great to be with you guys. Yeah, we're happy to have you here to talk about a topic that's becoming more top of mind for cannabis and hemp growers, and that's viruses. Yes, plants get viruses too. You and your team have published a paper in December that examined symptomatic hemp leaf samples from Colorado for beet curly top virus, which might be a virus that listeners might not be familiar with. But before we get into that, tell us a bit about what you found and what you published in the paper. So um, I moved to Colorado State University in 2018 and um, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw, who had done most of the work uh, on um, characterizing pest complex, uh, complex insect pests on hemp, had, um, you know, alerted me to these virus looking hemp plants um, in the field. Um, Of course, we didn't know anything at that time. It looked like, you know, very typical yellowing and stunting um, symptoms. And I was planning to go take a look at it in the 2019 field season. But before I could do it myself, we had growers reaching out to my lab and the plant diagnostic clinic here at CSU. It was just an outbreak. So, of course, we went out. uh, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw came out with us. And it was incredible. The range of symptoms, uh, which I published some of it in a short review in Outlooks and Pest Management. Um, And um, the high level of incidence, like you mentioned, 81% um, incidence is just staggering, uh, you know, in this new crop. Um, so it's pretty spectacular and uh, spread across, um, you know, the Western slope where we grow most of the hemp here in Colorado and the Northeastern uh, area as well. So pretty widespread. And um, my student who led that work, Judith Chiginski, we, we continued to survey in 2020 mm. uh, because the, the initial survey was in 2019 and 2020, it was limited because we had another virus disrupting our lives, COVID. Right. Still, we found in the limited survey, we found close to 100% BCTV in hemp. Wow. And then, but last year, I have some good news for my growers, um, only only around uh, 20%. We think it was, um, it was very dry and there was hardly anything green. Many hemp growers didn't even grow much hemp. uh, And the lack of, um, you know, um, green vegetation may, may have been one reason for uh, lower incidence. So it's been up and down. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, it's it, this disease, this virus has been around for over hundreds of years in other crop species. So it's uh, it's definitely to show up in hemp again. So that percentage of mm-hmm. um, of prevalence that you're finding with bee curly top virus now is that in symptomatic leaves only, or is that in asymptomatic plants as well? Very good question. So you know, in 2019, the work we published in the paper was very targeted. So it was just the symptomatic plants. And like I said, even that was questionable because we'd seen such range of symptoms from curling to something that we fondly call taco leaf. The leaf had completely curled up like like a taco would. All of them tested positive for BCTV. So only in symptomatic plants. But currently we are having an experiment in our greenhouse. We're working with this hemp genetics developing company here in Fort Collins, New West Genetics, and we're screening some of their lines. And um, some of them are asymptomatic, but test positive for BCTV uh, using PCR. Wow. Wow. And then, 
sorry, go ahead. Please go ahead. No. I was going to say, you know, and then you've seen our paper. We, we've had so many different viruses in there. Right. Um, and some of them were healthy. In fact, the, the, the sample from Larimer County uh, that had um, cannabis cryptic virus was right. healthy and beautiful as ever. So we really yeah. don't know the impact of these viruses and the one viroid, which is also pretty important. Yeah, I know that cannabis cryptic virus. It's no, it's no wonder why they call it cannabis cryptic, right? It's a, right. a bit of a mystery. Very cryptic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about other viruses too, because you know I had mentioned that it's viruses are becoming more top of mind for hemp and cannabis growers, but the one that's that gets all the publicity or gets all the notoriety is is actually the viroid, hoplite the viroid. So. Yes. I wonder how does beet curly top virus differ from hop latent viroid? How are they the same? Could there be some sort of um, a case of misidentification? People thinking they have hop latent viroid, they actually have beet curly top. Um, your thoughts on that? So, um, what's in we? I'm, I'm just going to initiate an um, hop latent viroid project to do a, like you said, you know, better characterization of it to help growers. But as the name suggests, it's latent. Right. So it's right. dormant in the plant and can go asymptomatic for, uh, you know, weeks to months is, is my understanding. But then it causes the so-called dudding. At least that's what the growers call it, where the flowers just don't flower and are completely, um, uh, you know, destroyed. Um, we haven't seen. So, in you know, um, we detected hoplate and viroid in our samples from two counties. And those samples predominantly had BCTV symptoms, had, you know, and coincidentally, they were infected um, with uh, hoplite and viroid, or may, it's possible that the samples came from a different plant and uh, because we had pooled samples, you know, from, from different plants in our um, sequencing. So um, um, I haven't firsthand seen it, but in talking with um, a colleague in um, uh, Simon Fraser University in Canada, uh, Dr. Zamir Punja, who is a very well-known hemp pat a plant pathologist, he was telling us how uh, predominant and prevalent it is in Canada with, I think he mentioned something like 70 or 80 percent of um, the cannabis uh, being infected with hop latent wow. viroid in a study that he had done, um, you know, so pretty staggering. Uh, how how it is so you know that's what I'm that's the big difference between BCTV and uh, hop latent viroid to me, but hoplite and viroid, unlike BCTV, can be transmitted mechanically, right? So you touch an infected plant and then uh, and you have no idea that it's infected because it's presumably it's asymptomatic and you uh, handle a healthy plant and it gets um, transmitted. Now with BCTV, fortunately, we only, there's only one mode of transmission, that's the beet leaf hopper. Hmm. No other species of leaf hopper can even transmit it to our knowledge. Oh, wow. Yeah, it is, it's, it's just such a tight evolutionary relationship, just one species. And I work with aphids that transmit viruses, like this potato virus Y, and there are over 60 species of aphids that can transmit the virus. But with BCTV, just the one. So um, that's really cool. And as far as we know, it's not seed transmitted, BCTV. We're, we're confirming that in our lab because some growers um have that concern hemp growers so that's the big difference so in in some ways i think hoplite and viroid because of the mechanical transmission is um, you know spreading more rampantly and in fact we just got a, a sample from a co colleague in um, california um, that outwardly looked like bctv but tested po positive for both bctv and hoplite and mm. viroid so you have this mix infection and who knows what kind of synergism or antagonism, you know, the multiple infections can have. Yeah, no, that's a great point about hoplite and viroid and sort of the unique challenges that that raises. Mm -hmm. Another thing to consider too is just, you know, the clonal propagation of cannabis yes. and hemp as well, right? If you're, yes. if you're taking a cutting from a plant that you presume is, yeah. is not infected, now you're handing a, a bomb to your uh, your colleague or your friend that's going to right, um, that's gonna right, exactly, and yeah, and then who know? Yeah, the impact on uh, yeah, with the with, uh, you know cross uh, cross state or cross country movement and introducing these pathogens 
because it's not very well uh, defined yet as yet, you know, seed certification or cuttings. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, certified clones too, that are, yeah, that are virus clone. free. Yep. I mean, yep. I know we ourselves at, in medicinal genomics, we're trying to, to develop PCR assays to help people screen and, and do things like that. Um, so maybe eventually we'll get there, but um, yeah, it's still very, um, very early in that process. So I want to come back to the leaf hoppers because that is really interesting. I didn't realize I, I read in the paper that it was, you know, the primary source of infection, but I didn't know that it was the only source. So um, I, I, I'm curious more sort of about that. Is it, how does that synergistic relationship work? Oh, that's a great question. So as I mentioned, you know, the virus and the vector, um, it, the vi virus is only able to, um, you know, infect a plant via the beet leaf hopper, this one vector, Circulifer tenellus. And um, then, and that's my training. I'm an entomologist by training. So in these fields, in these hemp fields, like you can see in my background, when we go or we, we use insect nets uh, to sweep, and there we found around eight to 10 different species of leaf hoppers. And we tested each and every one of them and only Circulifer tenellus was positive for this exact same strain that we were detecting in, um, in our hemp sample. So uh, to date, no one has shown any other mode means of transmission of BCTV. There was one study uh, from uh, Iran, I believe, showing BCT was seed transmitted in petunia, but not in, um, and it was very low uh, transmission rate, but not in sugar beets or tomatoes, some of the other major crops that BCTV infects. So the, the insect, picks up the virus uh, from an infected plant. It's a phloem uh, limited virus, right? It's in the flow, only in the phloem tissue of the, of the plant. So mm -hmm. the insect feeds on in the phloem, it's a phloem feeding insect, sucks up the virus, the virus enters the insect gut. It does not replicate uh, as far as we know. It just circulates through the gut of the insects and then comes and reinfects the salivary glands of the insect. And when the insect feeds on a healthy mm -hmm. plant, usually they salivate and that's when the the virus particles or the virions come out and infect the plant. Now, what's interesting is Judith, uh, second part of her thesis, my student that led this work, she, uh, we're getting ready to publish uh, where we're showing that virus infected insects actually have better um, reproduction, better um, life history characteristics. So, you know, when they get infected, they do better um, and able to proliferate more and spread the virus more. So the virus is, you know, uh, manipulating vector performance. And this has been shown for other systems, but first time for BCTV. Wow. Uh, so very intimate relationship. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. And am I correct in maybe assuming that the virus doesn't replicate via mechanical transmission because... The, the virus, um, you know, is exposed to the elements or whatever on the, the instruments that you might be using and it's not able to proliferate. But then if it's within the, the gut of this leafhopper, it's kind of more protected from that. Is that safe to now, assume? There are viruses that do proliferate via mechanical transmission, right. right? Like the most notorious one is tobacco mosaic virus. I mean, right. that is... Um, so... Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, th there's, th you know, how that come this evolutionarily tight relationship has come around with just this one species of insect vector. But presumably, you're right. They are, um, you know, being um, sort of um, protected um, by the insect vector. And then this insect feeds on over 100 different plant species oh. and able to transmit the virus to all of these species. Now, what's interesting is we find that uh, the insects cannot reproduce on hemp, beet leaf hoppers. They can, and for that matter, they don't do very well on tomato or pepper, the other major hosts. They can go maybe one generation. So the, the females can produce one set of offspring and then they just perish. Wow. So there's something, um, you know, they're not, they haven't evolved with this um, plant um, potentially, but but they can they still do feed on the plant, and in in during that time, it only takes a couple of um, hours for them, minutes to hours to transmit the virus. While they taste and they say, "Oh, I don't like this too much," 
this host too much. In the meantime, they are transmitting the virus. Interesting. So do the leafhoppers not particularly like the taste of, of hemp? They don't feed no, on it as much? They do not. In fact, more, you know, we, we, um, when we go looking for the leafhoppers in hemp, we hardly find a handful. But then uh, in, across, in the surrounding fields, we, or, you know, in the ditches, we see all these weeds, weed species. Co um, you know, dandelion and kochia and Russian thistle, that's where the leafhoppers are. They really thrive on these um, bouquet of uh, weed or buffet of uh, weed species. And of course, sugar beets, that's how we maintain them uh, in our lab. Yeah, that makes sense. Hence the name, right? Yes. So given the fact that it's just this particular species of leafhopper that's spreading, is this sort of a regional issue and less of an issue with in other areas? No, not at all. So in fact, um, leaf hoppers don't even overwinter in Colorado is what we believe. It gets too cold for them. We, at least we think uh, our, some of our tracking work has shown them that they, they are coming up from New Mexico and um, Arizona, the population. They overwinter there in the more uh, on weed species again, where it's more warmer, right, than it is in Colorado. And once those weeds dry down, they are moving northward. So it's a huge problem in um, beet leaf hoppers and BCTV is a huge problem in peppers in uh, New Mexico, uh, mm. in Arizona as well. But most importantly, in California, BCTV and uh, beet leaf hoppers, a huge issue on tomatoes and just devastated the tomato industry, you know, some decades ago, but we have some tools in tomatoes. And I, I've talked to some researchers at UC Davis that have confirmed BCTV in hemp. They just haven't published it as yet. Oh. Yeah. And, and I've also talked to some collab, some uh, colleagues in um, Oregon state where again, we have uh, BCTV and beet leaf purple and they've confirmed it in hemp as well. They just haven't uh, published the work. So it's, there at least, you know, um, Western United States, where most of the hemp is grown, it, it is um, an issue. Is it less of an issue in indoor cultivation facilities? So that's what I'm trying to figure out, because one of the growers that that is who is pretty convinced that it um, it's seed transmitted, he thinks that he got it in seeds, uh, not um, clones, but I don't know if... Um, a leaf hopper came in and infected the plant or if the BCTV came in via the seeds, you know, it's not hundred per, even in our greenhouse, they're not hundred percent, um, you know, insect proof. Sure. Um, they are pretty, they're bigger than something small, like mites or thrips, but, um, mm. uh, I definitely, um, be given that they like, like I mentioned, you know, this buffet of, um, or a variety of plants, they're more likely to be an outdoor issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I think it was when you were talking about tomatoes, that there are some tools to sort of be limiting the leaf hoppers um, from, you know, munching on the, the crop. So what are some of the options for preventing uh, beet curly top virus or these leaf hoppers from infecting your grow? I'm so glad you asked that. And, and you know, um, given that, like, given that this virus is only transmitted via, via the hoppers, it's important for entomologists and plant pathologists to work together, right? Hmm. But, um, and, and this, this is what uh, helped the industry, at least for tomatoes, um, there are varieties and, and for sugar beets too, there are varieties that are resistant to the virus. Um, um, they say it's between uh, low to moderate levels of resistance not not extremely high in um in tomatoes um they also use um insecticidal sprays yeah uh that, you know but none of that is an option for hemp growers in right. fact and and that that's okay but you know like i said it only takes a few minutes to hours to transmit the virus so timing is important you know how are the growers going to know when the leaf hoppers are coming in you know that it's tricky so what's worked for the sugar beet growers, because it's a huge problem in sugar beets, is uh, systemic insecticides that, that's in the plant. So you actually, in fact, here in Colorado and, and um, um, our region, sugar beet growers have to buy 
seeds, sugar beet seeds that are coated with the, with the systemic insecticide. So when the plant uh, germinates, the, uh, the insecticide is in the plant. Mm. So that gives them the protection for around um, roughly around 50 to 55 days when the first wave of the leaf hoppers are coming in from the south and that protects them. But none of that is an option for hemp growers, right? In fact, um, that's where the issue is. And my collaborators from California, the ones that sent us that tissue, we just submitted a proposal trying to come up with um, management tactics for um, hemp growers. Wow. And so I wonder if we could talk a bit more about sort of once the plant is infected, sort of what's the timeline in terms of, you know, how the disease progresses and does it eventually kill the plant and just totally wipe it out? Or is it more like a hop latent viroid situation where it's just the yield and quality is greatly reduced? You know, that's such, such a good question. So like I mentioned, our whole culture, we've got um, cultures of beet leaf hoppers um, in the lab and we maintain them on sugar beet and sugar beets just die in a matter of uh, a, a week to 10 days because they're preferred host. They just go, you know, I, I wish you could come see our colony. We cannot keep up with um, the pressure and how fast because of course they're using a susceptible, uh, you know, line of sugar beets. Now with hemp, it's not that drastic. And I've gone to visit fields over weeks and you can see the plant, it still looks pretty bad, but not dead yet. And, and that's one thing I tell my growers, you see an infected plant or you suspect one that's looking infected, get rid of it so mm. it doesn't serve as a, as a source. So hemp lasts longer. In fact, you know, we're doing this um, screening right now and um, several weeks, months, and the plants look, look, look diseased, but not dead yet. Eventually, mm. I, I am sure they will. What we need to figure out in hemp and um, um, its top priority for my lab is to see how the virus affects cannabinoids and the quality. Yes. CBD but in particular, that needs to be done. I, um, growers tell me that the yield is reduced and the flower quality is, uh, is poor, but we haven't had any actual evidence of that. Okay. And, and so I, I heard you say there, so is the, is the recommendation too, if you, if you identify an affected plant, just, just pull it immediately. Pull is, it. De is, yes, is, definitely. And then after my students work, we can tell the growers that two um, dandelion and um, Russian thistle are uh, top, you know, there are some specific weeds that they need to, in fact, any weeds just get a, a surrounding hemp. You need to just get rid of it. Yeah. I was, all, yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because you mentioned that, you know, the leafhoppers, they don't prefer hemp, but you know, they'll, they'll take a bite if they're kind of buffeting on yeah, some yeah. other, um, some other plants in the area. So yeah, right. I was going to ask if it makes sense to kind of make sure that there's a an air that you clear the area around your grow to kind of prevent that totally yes definitely yeah uh, that's a that's a great idea too and then another thing we do and you can see in the in my background I'm, I'm, i don't know if you can see very closely you know uh, growers use mulches plastic mulches right for uh, mainly for weed control mm -hmm. But there are some mulches, research has been done with aphids and other insects there are some reflective mulches that um, you know uh, reflect light off and that prevents the insects from landing on the plants. So we're trying to test that to see if maybe growers could just switch or use a different kind of mulch uh, that could then um, you know act as um, weed control and also confer um, other benefits like uh, reduce the pest landing, especially leaf, leaf hoppers. So some small easy things that they can do um, to reduce. Uh, you know, infection. Yeah. You know, and I know that there are, are some folks who with other viruses are attempting tissue culture as a way to um, produce a new virus free variety. Mm -hmm. Has that been attempted with anything that's been infected with the curly top virus? Is that not an option? So um, we do have a tissue culture lab here at CSU and, and we're trying and I've given her, you know, our primer, some of our leaf tissue and RNA samples uh, to develop um, some diagnostic tools. So then she can test uh, these tissue cultured plants. But I think it's 
very much in um, you know uh, early stages not anything ready for commercial um, uh, you know uh, not commercially available but pretty much once a month like just last couple of days ago i got an email from a diagnostic company want you know wanting samples um, from our study to develop uh, diagnostic tools but the issue is not all states are allowed you know can work even right. on hemp for that matter never yeah. mind marijuana <laughs> yeah, yeah that is definitely uh, a challenge that we need to navigate as we yes. as we explore these plants so i was wondering I know that you identified other viruses and viroids um, in some of these samples in your paper. Um, anything interesting there that you know growers should be aware of, or that maybe you and your team are going to be uh, investigating in the in the years to come here? That's a great question. You know, my department head, uh, Dr. Amy Charkowski, she told me once. You know, when I was telling her about all the viruses we found, she's like, "You have your career here. You can just keep <laughs> studying this." Right. And that's and that'll that'll do it. Uh, so yes, of course, hoplite and viroid, and I'm, uh, there's a grower coming, bringing bringing me some uh, samples, some plants infected, so we can figure this out. And um, and actually, there's one report of uh, hop aphid transmitting hoplite and viroid. So I want to look into uh, aphid transmission. The other one that I I think was particularly interesting in our virome analysis is was uh, tobacco streak virus. Mm -hmm. um, the reason it's interesting is because it uh, it has a worldwide distribution. It goes to it infects several species and trips transmitted. And you know any any grower doing any kind of um, you know agriculture is aware are familiar with trips. Uh, highly ubiquitous, several species of trips transmitted. And what's interesting is our uh, sequences indicate that it's a new genotype of virus or a new um, isolate of this tobacco streak virus in hemp. Interesting. So, you know, so um, that makes it all the more um, challenging. Um, and uh, tobacco streak virus goes to peppers and all these other crops that we grow here in Colorado and definitely in other places. So I think that's, that's an interesting one. But then, you know, you think about cannabis cryptic virus and this uh, cannabis sativa mitovirus. Mm -hmm. uh, this, all of them, I, I have no clue what they do. And um, yeah. Were Lots you surprised? Yeah, go we, ahead. Sorry. We touched on it before, but were you surprised not to find tobacco mosaic virus? I was surprised not to find, but I, I believe, um, again, talking to my uh, colleague in uh, Canada, they have found tobacco mosaic virus. Oh, we did not. True? Yes, he, they did. Um, what was the other one I was going to say? Oh, and the other uh, paper that we just published last week um, was showing uh, cannabis aphid. It's a newly identified aphid. It's original to Asia. We only discovered it in uh, Colorado in 2015, a couple of years ago. And now it's one of the most prolific aphids in um, this potato growing region here in Colorado. And uh, happens to transmit very efficiently potato virus Y, which is the number one virus that affects potato uh, crops. So, but we did not find potato virus Y in our hemp samples. Okay. It, it's possible. Right. Yeah. I think everything's yeah. on the table, huh? Yes. Hemp has just, you know, changed the whole um, patho system. No. And I wasn't aware that folks had identify tobacco mosaic virus in cannabis and or hemp yet. I know we have a lot of customers asking us about it. We haven't been able to find it in the literature. So if you do have some information, we'd be definitely I, be interested in that. I can definitely put you in touch. I'm pretty sure uh, he mentioned this, uh, but it's not, it's not published. Okay. Or, okay. Yeah. Good. So, um, but I could put you in touch with Dr. Zamir Punja. He's super. Oh, yeah. oh I didn't yeah. realize it was Dr. Punja. Yeah. We, it was Dr. Punja. Yes. Yep, he's, yeah. He's been a guest on the podcast before. Has he now? Yeah. So reach out to him unless I'm mistaken. But you're right. So that's prolific it is. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that we haven't found it. Yeah. Especially, I mean, again, we have a lot of customers who are interested in it. So I've done, I've done some research and, mm -hmm. you know, interesting to find out that it was the first virus ever identified and that it's, you know, it sounds like it's very robust and can, um, 
you know, can still be viable long after oh. it's it's been on, you know, other surfaces. So uh, TMV, I, I've even heard that it can be on cigarette. Uh, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, we had a customer mention that, like, oh, I don't let yeah. anyone who smokes go anywhere well, near our plants. And we were kind of yeah. thinking he was just paranoid. But then you read more about it and like, no, that seems pretty prudent, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. So winding down here, um, again, I think you mentioned some of the, the things that your, your team is working on and things to come. Um, I will give you an opportunity to, to share that again. And if there's any website or materials or social media or anything people can connect with you and stay up to date with the with the work that you guys are doing please plug away oh that's great thank you so like, like i mentioned we just um published this paper on cannabis aphid um being a vector for pvy what we're doing now and this is funded by usda which is so great that you know the usda has removed these um uh uh, restrictions against the crop, which allows researchers to get funded. So I have um, uh, uh, good funding for um, to work on pests. And the, the big one we are focusing on is hemp mite. It's sure. almost a virus. It's microscopic. So that's a huge one that we're focusing on. Uh, another USDA grant is looking at a more systematic um, uh, survey of um, the virome across uh, different um, growth plant Phenology or growth stages, different cultivars to see, you know, if there is some natural resistance. Um, so that's an, one project that we're looking on. Um, we're we're just our university is in the process of updating our website. So we're but we, we're coming up with the hemp disease website to have, uh, you know, um, all of this information um, updated there. But of course, I would love uh, to connect with. People on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Uh, just my name, uh, Nacha Papunya, I believe, is the handle. So uh, yes, um, there'll definitely be more things coming. And uh, the other thing, lastly, I wanted to talk about um, sort of the adaptive role of cannabinoids. You know, there's mm -hmm. research coming out about how CBD has, in some cases, a negative impact, some cases a positive impact. So we're looking into that. Um, on insects with different mouth parts, like an aphid with a piercing mouth part, hemp russet mite that has more like a little stub and a chewing mouth part like corn earworm or a Eurasian hemp odor. So we're trying to see how it affects different insects that feed differently. So that's very exciting too. Yeah, that is exciting. And you touched on something we, we probably should have talked about it is uh, resistance, right? I mean, yes. when you say that, you know, pesticides and some mm. of these options aren't available to, to hemp yeah. growers, um, identifying natural resistance and breeding for that would, would definitely be an option. Yes. And growers, you know, um, of course, we're working with New West Genetics and that's, that's really great. But growers, as you probably know, they are doing their own little breeding and, uh, uh, yes. you know, uh, developing their own varieties and they swear of, of how one is more resistant than or tolerant to another. So I think that is going to be key for um, hemp, um, given how limited the insecticide um, options are. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Punya, thank you again for, for joining us on the podcast. Um, very interested in learning more about your work and everything. I think um, it's going to be very important for, for the industry going forward. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. Anytime when, when I have more more uh, or newer data, yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to you to come share it. Yeah, thank you. This is so great to get the word out there. Absolutely. Thanks again. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Punya Nachapa. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, Eugentech. Our next episode drops March 30th. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, please do check out the CanMed archive and join the CanMed community Facebook group to stay connected with us. Of course, you can also stay in touch with us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Just search for CanMed Events. Sign up for email alerts on canmedevents.com to stay up to date with all the latest news, 
And please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Doing so helps us reach more listeners. I do sincerely hope to see all of you out in Pasadena this spring. But until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and please join us for the next CanBed Coffee Talk.